We got an hour. We got to get through this. So we're going to finish it up here. All right. Bites and stings. When we talk about bees and wasps, we probably have all at some point been bit by a bee or a wasp or had somebody um, that we know bit by a bee or a wasp. Typically, the sting itself is not um, a huge deal. It's when the patient is allergic to some type of bee or wasp sting and we have anaphylaxis that occurs. We see this quite a bit in the pediatric population. They do tend to outgrow it though. So it is one of those that as a huge allergy as a, as a child, but we do see this allergy uh, kind of disappear as the patient gets older. Um, when we are talking about the sting itself, or the sting itself, um, usually the area is red and warm and swollen. Um, there is pain with it. Of course, we want to remove that stinger as soon as possible. Um, it does cut down on the amount of toxin that is injected into the skin. But again, like I said, what we're really worried about is if the patient is allergic to that and has some type of anaphylactic reaction. Um, the patient, it doesn't matter where the patient is bit, if they have an anaphylactic reaction, um, they can be bit anywhere in the body and have this reaction. It doesn't mean that they have to be bit on the face or the um, neck or the um, upper body to have an anaphylactic reaction. But when we talk about anaphylaxis, it's typically respiratory that we think about. Remember, there are uh, about five different systems involved with anaphylaxis. Not only respiratory, GI symptoms are involved. It affects cognitive function. There are lots of things that go into play with an um, anaphylactic reaction, not just the respiratory issues that the patient can develop. Like I said, we want to remove the stinger as soon as possible. Your version of the textbook says that you can use tweezers, so you can use tweezers. The previous version said you could not use tweezers. The rationale was is that you could actually break the stinger off as you were trying to pull it out. Um, tape, you can use tape. You can also use um, credit cards, just a stiff card, and scrape the top of the, uh, the bite and, or the sting, and it will remove the stinger. Uh, we do apply ice to these. And if the patient has an allergy, we use epi or epi pins, uh, the, if the patient has an epi pin. And histamines, Benadryl. My parents used to always use a baking soda paste. It was like baking soda and water and they would put on it um, just to draw some of kind of the heat out of it. But antihistamines work for these bites uh, or stings as well. If the patient has an anaphylactic reaction, um, then there is all kinds of drugs that they get. Epi being one of them, we can give it IV, we can give it sub-Q, we can give it IM. We can also give uh, IV antihistamines, we give steroids, we give um, H2 blockers. So they typically get Zyrtec, Zantac, um, some type of IV steroid, Epi, just get this whole cocktail of, of drugs. Um, I have had two anaphylactic reactions um, in my life. Neither one of them do I know what it was from. Um, and both times, the drug fog that I had after being in the ER uh, took me a week or so to get over. From all of the steroids, from all of the epi, from all of the, the drugs that I received. Uh, so they will have a period of just recovering from, from the drugs themselves as well. Uh, many times we can monitor them in the ER and discharge them from the ER. Uh, on rare occasions we do admit these patients to the hospital. Dog bites. We're going to talk about dog and cat bites. We do see dog and cat bites in the ER as well. The big difference between those is the destruction that occurs. We tend to see children as our victims of dog and cat bites, usually boys, less than about six to eight years of age is where we see most of our dog bites. I get it. I have a 10-year-old. He survived that six to eight-year-old range, and my dog should have tore him up more than once, um, but she never did. Um, and so I, I get why we see it in that, in that age group. They're inquisitive, 
they have no boundaries, they're rough, they, um, and so they just are in that animal's space and won't leave them alone. So we do see bites in that age group. Um, infection is the biggest thing we worry about with both the cat and dog bites. With dog bites, we typically see very mechanical destruction. It's usually a bite and a tearing type motion. So we see mechanical destruction of the, of the tissue. Many times it's, um, it's not, we're not able to put it back together. It's very jagged, there's rough edges, um, there's an avulsion of that tissue, and it just doesn't go back together nicely. Cat bites tend to be puncture wounds. Usually around the hands is where we see cat bites, um, but they're usually very neat and clean puncture wounds. The problem is, is they typically are around joints and we have to worry about infection of those joints with, with cats. This is one of the reasons that we see dog bites. Uh, as much as we would like to call them our children and the, our kids and the second part of our family, and they're still animals. They are still pack animals. They still um, innately um, will hunt and they are very possessive over food. That is just part of their DNA. And so we see a lot of bites around food. Sometimes it's intentional, sometimes it's unintentional. They get excited, they're ready to eat something and your hand's in the way, or they're trying to protect their food and there's a child playing in their food bowl. Um, so we do see bites around food as well. Um, as bad as that little face looks, it's really probably more of a warning than a real bite. That was a uh, stay out of my way, you're in, that, that tissue is still intact is what I'm telling you. Um, we, I had a, we had a child mauled by a dog several years ago. Um, family brought home two new dogs, didn't know anything about them. Uh, they were in the backyard. They had them separated, fenced in. The toddler got out of the house to go play with the new dogs, and they almost ate him alive. Like parts of his thigh and his butt and his biceps and part of his face. He had muscle groups missing. Um, from from the from the mauling of these these two dogs. Um, so when in comparison, yes, that looks rough on that little face, but that tissue is still intact. That will heal nicely. That can be cleaned and sutured, and you probably would never even see that once it was healed up. Uh, like I mentioned, cat bites or puncture wounds. Again, around joints, we typically see, and we have to worry about infection with those. We have to worry about those septic joints. We do see dog bites in the upper extremities and in the face area. Um, and again, infection is a big concern with those as well. They do have to be reported to the state. And just because a dog bites doesn't mean that the dog is euthanized. Um, first time a dog bites and they can't, the owner can't show proof of rabies vaccination. The dog is put in 10 days of quarantine. And so for 10 days they watch them and see if they um, ex exhibit signs of rabies. If they don't, they'll vaccinate the dog and give the dog back to the owner. It's the, repet the uh, repetitive bites that you'll see euthanasia, uh, euthanasia occur or if the dog starts showing symptoms of um, rabies. Rabies shots which is interesting, rabies vaccinations for animals are recommended yearly, but they're actually good for about five years. So a dog can have a rabies vaccination and it can be out of date by a year or even two years and they're still covered because the vaccination is actually good much longer than our recommendation of a yearly vaccination for them. Um, <coughs> So what do we do? We clean the wounds, lots and lots of flushing, uh, soap and water, we clean them and we try to leave them loosely sutured. We want them to have airflow to drain for things to come out of them. Patients go on antibiotics, puncture wounds we typically leave open and then everybody gets a tetanus shot if they're out of date on their tetanus shot uh, and if we don't know the rabies status uh, vaccination of the dog, the, they have the option for the rabies series as the person that's been bit. The rabies series 
Um, the first dose is weight based. So depending on how much you weigh depends on how many injections you actually get. The latter doses are just a single dose that they come in for. Um, it's on a, like an odd day schedule. So like day one is your initial and then it's like day three and maybe day five or seven. But it runs for almost two weeks, but it's kind of odd day schedules. It's not every other day, but there's about four, four or five injections in that two, two week period. Um, we had a baseball team one time that found a dead raccoon, like only a baseball team, and thought it would be great to put this dead raccoon in the bottom of their five gallon bucket of baseballs. And so as the coach is pitching to them, he's pulling out balls out of this. See, our guys are laughing because they think this is hilarious. The girls are already grimacing. Um, they, he's pulling these baseballs out, pitching for batting practice. And they think it's going to be hilarious when he gets to the bottom of the five-gallon bucket and finds a dead raccoon. Problem is, is that raccoon died from rabies, and it was a rabid raccoon. And everyone on that baseball team got to come in for rabies vaccinations for the next two weeks. So the joke was on them. But, but, um, do what now? So we have fun. You did. <laughs> you live life to its fullest. That is for sure. Um, so we do we do see it with cats and dogs. We also see um, raccoons and possums and things like that. I had a lady one time whose bird bath turned over. She went to pick up the top of the bird bath, and it was a um, possum that had knocked it off, and it was rabid and, and ate her hands off. And so she ended up in our ER from from a, a possum, a raccoon, no possum, she was a possum. Um, so anyways, back to that, we do have tetanus shots, we do have, do rabies um, vaccines as well, or um, shots, and then antibiotics, they all get antibiotics, because we have to worry about infection with these. Um, they, the mouths of these animals are not clean, so um, they have to worry about infection. <sighs> One of the ways that we can prevent dog and cat bites is just supervision of the child around the animal. Uh, teaching the children how to behave around them is another big one. Um, we have a 11 month old puppy at our house. She is a Bernadoodle. She's about 65 pounds currently. Um, and my 10 year old thinks that she should be his next wrestling partner. Well, she's not intended to wrestle. She does a really good job with it, but, but uh, teaching him that he can't just body slam the dog on the bed and that's okay is is one of those you have to teach those behaviors. Like I said, he should be eaten alive more than once um, at his own fault. But monitoring their behavior and teaching them how to behave is, is a big one. Um, our previous dog, Sally, she was an American Bulldog. She weighed about 90 pounds and had a head on her that was the biggest part of her body. Um, but she had a bed and if Sally was on her bed you didn't get to mess with Sally that's her space you had to leave her alone now if she was just laying on the floor kids were fair games like they could play all over her and she knew it but when she got tired of my now 10 year old she'd get up and go to her bed and that was the boundary as Carter knew he couldn't get on the dog's bed like he would try but that's when he got in trouble um, and so making sure that they have that separated space as well Human bites. We see human bites. So there are two times that we see human bites. We see human bites as a normal developmental um, process in our toddlers. And then we see human bites in adults. When we have human bites in adults, it should be a red flag. It should be a red flag for assault. Usually sexual assault is associated with human bites. So. If you have a patient that comes in with human bites, again, developmentally it is appropriate in our toddler age group, um, but if we have the adult that comes in with human bites, um, it should be a red flag for you to investigate probably more for some type of sexual assault. We do tend to see those bites on hands, um, ears, and in the peritoneal area of the patient. So just be mindful of that, that there is usually some type of sexual assault that's associated with them. Um, bites less than a quarter of an inch, 
We typically, um, they don't need medical attention. That's typically when I think about the little toddler front two teeth that broke the skin. They're that little quarter inch. You can wash them, put some uh, polysporin on them. They're good, treat them at home. It's much larger bites that we see in our ER. Um, again, in the adult, there's usually some type of sexual assault with it. Um, just like with dog and cat bites, we have to wash them, clean them out, put these patients on antibiotics, give them tetanus shots, uh, and many times they'll need pressure dressings because of capillary oozing that they have. There may not be anything to actually sew up, but they'll have capillary oozing that will need some type of pressure dressing. All right, let's move to the third set of PowerPoints. Again, substance we don't cover. Um, your hallucinogenics, your uppers, we don't cover any of those. We are going to start with suicide is where we start. What a great topic. Yes. It is, yes. We just don't cover it in class. It's still there for you. Yep. All right, suicides. When we talk about suicides, um, we are talking about um, an age group, the, uh, somewhere around 15 to 24. To me, the, of, I guess the older I get, the younger that sounds. However, what a young age group that we see is the third leading cause of death is suicide, um, 15 to 24. So now why? Why do we see that? Well, we see that because we know that the brain is not fully developed at that age. The human brain is still developing at that Third, uh, that 15 to 24 year old age group. We know that this is where hormones change. These children hit puberty. We have um, awkward situations when it comes to friend groups and trying to fit in and peer groups. It's just um, a very tough time frame in, in developmental uh, developing that we see a lot of these suicides. We see um, these kids struggling with sexuality. We see them struggling with family issues. We see them struggling with social and peer groups. Um, we, of course, had a upswing in suicides along with social media. Um, there's lots of research to show where social media is impacting the suicide rates of, of these kids because their brains cannot developmentally handle um, the impact of social media. So we have lots of combinations, but ultimately what we see is depression. We see an underlying call of depression in all of these patients. The number one cause of suicide is the un untreated depression. One in every 25 will die. Um, we see about 30,000 deaths a year from suicide. I had a semester about three years ago that we had three in the ICU at the same time that were all suicide attempts and all ultimately successful. Um, all of them less than 18 years of age, between 13 and 18 years of age. Um, statistically, males are more likely to commit suicide. Females are more likely to attempt suicide. So you have more suicide attempts with females. You have more suicides that are successful with males. Why? Females not serious. They ain't serious enough. <laughs> not that they're not serious. There's a big difference. Not necessarily. It is how, but what underlying and how? Pills versus guns, but why? Why? Because females are more vain. Vanity is the underlying difference in those two. I believe that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but you know what? Alta would go out of business because of this female. So. 
<laughs> um, because of females will not typically distort their body for suicide, and men will. Do it now. <laughs> um, men will use guns. They'll be the ones that come in as gunshots, typically under the chin or in the mouth. Um, they're gunshots. Our women are typically our overdoses, our, our pills and our alcohol. Is their intent the same? Yes. Do women still want to kill themselves? Yes. They just can't bring themselves to pull a trigger. And so that is the big difference in why we see most of our attempts in females, most of our success in males with suicides. We also have to look at things like copycat and cluster suicides. And I never, I have seen one case of copycat suicide. I've never seen cluster suicides. However, they exist. So copycat suicide, a patient commits suicide and somebody significant to them, mother, father, brother, sister, friend, boyfriend, girlfriend, significant other, um, feels that they can't live without them and then commits suicide. That is considered a copycat suicide. Their attempt or their way that they commit suicide does not have to be the same. It just means that they died, killed themselves as a result of a previous suicide. Cluster suicides typically happen in your females. And cluster suicides are more of a pack. It is a group of friends that will either get together and meet at a house and overdose together, or they will find a time and a place, or they will find a date and a time, and they will all in their individual locations commit suicide at the same time by overdosing. It is typically overdosing that you see your cluster suicides. Um, so they do exist. I have not taken care of a cluster suicide, but I have taken care of copycat suicides. Violence. Oh, well, let's talk about treatment of suicides for just a second, and the, the hopefully the prevention of suicides. Um, we have lots of pa patients that come in that scream, I'm going to commit suicide. Can we ignore that? No. Many times do we feel like it's attention seeking? It could be, absolutely. But the minute that we ignore it, it is truly somebody reaching out for help and, and they do commit suicide. So as healthcare providers, if the words come out of their mouth that I'm going to commit suicide, you have to investigate it. You may do things like asking, do you have a plan? Do you have a time? What is your intention? Are you just wanting to ease pain? Or are you really wanting to die? Because some people are just wanting to get out of the situation that they're in. They don't really want to die. They just really want to change the environment. They want to leave the, the circumstances that they're in. Um, and so you have to do some more investigation. We have to put them on suicide precautions. We have to make sure that they're safe. That is priority for the patients. But we also have to treat the underlying issue. And many times it's depression. Um, we'll see it sometimes with drug abuse. We'll see it um, so with some <coughs> mental health issues, um, schizophrenia, some of those, paranoia, some of those. But we really see the depression. So treating that underlying depression in the patient. Violence. Um, domestic violence specifically. When we talk about domestic violence, um, we are basically talking about Violence that occurs out of some type of fear or anger is typically the emotion that the violence occurs out of. Um, I try to keep this gender neutral because we do have men that are the victims of domestic violence. If you ask my husband, he'd tell you who's a victim of domestic violence. Just don't listen to me. Um, but we do have men that are victims of domestic violence. By far, the majority of our victims of domestic violence are women. However, we do, uh, we do have men that are victims of domestic violence. And so there's several things that we see with um, domestic violence. We can see it in lots of places, um, violence in general. Your ER is one of the highest areas of workplace violence there is. Um, because we get everything under the sun through the double doors of, a, of an ER. And so we do have to worry about um, violence uh, workplace violence in the ER as well. But 
Um, violence typically has a cycle. Oh, hold on. Let's talk about characteristics first. Um, we do have factors that promote violence. One of those being culture. A culture where um, men are dominant um, is a uh, culture where you see more domestic violence. Um, or when women feel trapped, you'll see domestic violence. And we'll talk about that with the cycle as well. Um, abusers. It is impressive to me how telling an abuser can be on themselves. You don't even have to ask the victim who is abusing them. The abuser that typically will come in with them is, is telling on themselves in their whole mannerism. Um, these, pe these people are very jealous. They're very possessive. They're very controlling. They're usually, at the time of an ER visit, they are overly concerned about the patient because there is a remorse that they have after abusing the victim. Um, and typically alcohol is involved and many times they are victims of abuse themselves. Um, and so we see a cycle with this. Uh, I took care of just one. I took care of a lady one time who, I was triaging that day. Remember, I didn't like triage. Triaging that day, it was always eventful when I was there. You didn't want me in triage phase. Um, it was going to be a bad day. We, I was in triage, and this lady comes in. Um, she's, she's a fairly, she's probably 5'4", five, 5'5", five, five, maybe 100 pounds, very petite um, woman, and she is being carried by this man. He, he walks in, he puts her in the triage chair, and he's standing there and he is petting her. And that's one of my biggest pet peeves. Don't pat me. Don't pet me. Um, but he is patting her. He's petting her. She never makes eye contact with me. Never. The entire time I'm talking to her. And I'm not a very passive person, so I'll get in your face if I need you to make some co eye contact with me. Not her. She never looked at me. She never spoke. She never said a word. He answered every question that she had all the way down to when her last menstrual cycle was. He was telling me she wasn't. So about the time that he answered when her last menstrual cycle was, I was like, okay, I got to step in here. And so she comes in, according to him, complaining about a right ankle injury. Her right ankle was swollen. It did look like it was probably um, um, sprained claims that she fell down some stairs and twisted her ankle. No one ever addressed the black eyes that she had. Not a soul. I even asked. I just got ignored um, about the, her black eye. They only wanted to, he only wanted to focus on the ankle. And so at the point that he answers what, when her last menstrual cycle was, I looked at him and I said, thank you so much for the information that you had given me. However, if you don't mind having a seat right here beside her and let me ask her some questions to make sure that cognitively she, she understands what's going on or there's nothing going on cognitively from her fall. When I ask him to basically sit down and shut up, guess what? He lost it. He exploded in that triage booth on me. And before I realized it, about half the ER was behind me. So he never got to me for coming across the counter but instantaneously, because a female had just asked him to sit down and shut up, he lost it. Poor impulse control. Um, very possessive, very controlling of the situation. He was in that remorse phase. He had just beat the hell out of her. He was petting and doting and overly concerned and carrying her into the ER and setting her in a chair. Um, Dothan PD politely escorted him out of our ER. Um, she never filed charges. Left and went back to the environment. How frustrating. And we'll talk about that as we move through this. So domestic violence has a cycle. There is a tension building phase. There is a battering incident, the abuse itself. And then there is a honeymoon phase or a makeup phase. This cycle changes in lengths as the relationship develops. So early in the relationship, what you will have are extremely long honeymoon phases. 
those honeymoon phases will be really long. There is a short tension building phase, and then there's the battering incident, and then the long honeymoon phase. The longer those people are together, that cycle kind of shifts, and we start seeing shorter honeymoon phases and more and more frequent tension building and battering instances to the point that ultimately the victim is either going to leave or die. And that's kind of where we get at, at, through the relate, that transition of this, this um, relationship and that violence. <coughs> so we have to, by law, screen everyone that comes in for domestic violence. Now, does that mean that every person that walks through the door, we look at them and say, hey, Jay, are you a victim of domestic violence? No. And if we did, what are they going to tell us? No. So how do we screen without just directly asking? You assess what's going on. Absolutely. One of the big flags of abuse is that the story doesn't match the injury. And, like, they're creative, but they're not creative enough to figure out that their story doesn't match the, match the injury. So um, the story doesn't ma match the injury is a big one that we see. What do we do for these patients? We educate them. We refer them when we can. We try to get them out of that environment, but realize that 99% of the time they are going back. Why are they going to go back? Because one, that's what they're used to. They feel like they don't have anywhere else to go. They feel trapped, so they go back. Fear. Fear of their lives and the lives of their kids. So they'll go back to keep from feeling like somebody's going to kill them or kill their children. Remember that, that the abuser is typically a master manipulator as well. Not only have they manipulated a victim into a submissive, um, isolated role, they will try to manipulate you as a healthcare provider for that patient. They will act like they're your best friends. They will try to get the inside scoop. They'll want to know everything that's going on. They will try to manipulate the situation. And usually they will get upset if they don't manipulate the situation. And that's when they act out in our ERs is when they're not getting the control that they, they need or the manipulation that they need. Um, the victim can also, again, be nonverbal. Many times they'll shut down. Um, we have vague symptoms. 85% of females that come to the ER for domestic violence present with vague abdominal pain. They will never come in telling you that they're a victim of domestic violence. They'll come in with vague symptoms. Usually it's abdominal symptoms. Why? Because it's hard to identify. There's so much that goes on in the abdomen. It could be ovarian cysts. It could be um, kidney stones. It could be appendicitis. It could be um, just an ulcer. It could be diverticulitis. There are so many things in the abdomen that they just generally come in with vague symptoms. By the way, what does stress do? Causes ulcers. What else? Like, come on. Y'all get stressed. GI symptoms, right? So we may see a change in diet. We'll see a change in bowel habits. We'll see a change. We'll have abdominal cramping. We see all of those things. Stress itself causes some of those symptoms, and that's why they come in. They're under such severe stress. They're having these vague symptoms, and they don't even realize that their symptoms are from the the stress of the abuse that they're receive, that they're the victim of. Um, discrepancies between histories and injuries. Uh, did I tell you about my 18 month old that was burned? Okay, so. We had a child who came into the ER. So let me give you some background. The mother was probably less than 18 years of age. So a very young mother. Grandmother was also very young. So grandmother might have been 40, 45 years old. So when I'm talking about grandmother, I'm not talking 85. I'm talking 40, 45 when I'm saying grandmother. 
So mother and grandmother have gone to get their nails done and left the toddler, the 18 month old, with grandmother's boyfriend, who by the way, is not a new boyfriend. He's been in the, in the family for almost 10 years. So longer than the child had been alive, this man had been in the family. Um, left the child with the, grand, the grandmother's boyfriend to go, so they went to get their nails done. Mom and grandmother come home and boyfriend is standing in the yard with the toddler who is lifeless, listless, fully dressed, in his hands, waiting on them to arrive so they can take the baby to the hospital. They live in an outlying area. They drive into Dothan and they show up in the ER. I happen to be standing right there at the door. This was before doors were locked. And mom comes busting through the door, screaming for help with an infant whose head is laid back, arms are flail, and legs are just flaccid in this mother's arms. I thought the child was dead, um, is the way that he looked when she literally threw him at me because I was standing there. Um, and so I grabbed the child, yelled for a doctor, and went to one of our rooms and started cutting clothes off this child. And he had burns. He had burns on his head, his right chest, his right arm, his right side of his back. And then about his diaper line, the burns stopped. They were gone. And we're talking partial thickness to full thickness burns down this, chest, this baby's right side, anterior and posteriorly. He is not crying. He is not whimpering. He is not upset at the situation. His eyes are open. He is breathing. Um, he is not upset at the situation. We laid sterile towels down, immediately realized that he is burned, put an IO in him, started fluids, started pain meds, and mother, grandmother come running in, and my ER doctor um, starts asking what has happened. Well, the child was in the bathtub, and the, the faucets were where the child could reach them. The phone rang and the boyfriend went to answer the phone. While he was out of the bathroom, the child reached up, turned on the hot water, and the hot water came down on the head and the right side of the body. Where the child was sitting in the water, the water temperature was much cooler, the burn stopped is where the water hit the bathtub water. That was the story. My ER physician said, you need to call the sheriff's department and escort the family out. What? Okay. You said to. I'm going to do it. I'm going to take your word for it. Um, and so I escorted mother and grandmother out, called the sheriff's department, because this did happen outside of Dothan city limits. Um, and we took care of this child, shipped this child to Birmingham. Um, about... Three months later, he died from infections, from the burns that he had received from this. And so finally, I had an 18-year-old, 18 18-month-old. 18 the child was born the exact same day as my oldest child. And I can remember walking up to my ER physician and saying, okay, I've missed something. Why did you call the sheriff's department? Because I can see my 18-month-old reaching up, grabbing the hot water, and this hot water burning my, my child. As a matter of fact, I called my mother-in-law who was staying at home with my child and said, I'm sorry, but you cannot bathe her tonight. Like, I, you just have to understand that I will need to bathe her when I get home. She's like, okay. She never asked questions. She was amazing. Um, but he said, because the burns that we just saw don't occur from hot water heaters. The water in a hot water heater can't get hot enough to cause these burns. And I thought, I never thought about that. I don't know how hot a hot water heater gets. I know mine gets really warm and I like it. But I didn't know how hot hot water heaters would get. Sure enough, come to find out what later down the road, he had boiled water on the stove, taken it to the tub, and poured it over the child's head while the child was in the tub. An instance of abuse where the story didn't match the assessment of the patient took them five years to convict him of murder for, of that child. But again, a discrepancy between history and injury is how the majority of abuse is found. So what is our role? Because guess what? Not only do we get to take care of the victim, guess who else we take care of many times? The abuser. We'll take care of abusers as well. 
And so taking care of the victim. How hard is it? And it's probably much harder for myself than some, for some people, but most people that work in an ER are very type A personalities. You just don't come to an ER as a very soft-spoken individual and survive. Like you can get eaten alive in an ER. You have to have a little bit of backbone to you to survive an ER. And so for me, it was really hard, and I really had to check myself many times and go, okay, I'm taking care of a victim, and they won't press charges, and they're leaving and going back to the same situation. You know what I wanted to do? I wanted to shake them and go, wake the hell up. He's going to beat you again. That's what I wanted to do. Can I do that? No. no. Can I judge her for going back? No. And it took me a long time to realize that that was probably the safest thing for her to do. What? Go back is the safest thing? Absolutely. That's right. Because it's the honeymoon phase next. So that honeymoon phase is good for a while. Now the smart thing is during that honeymoon phase, figure out how to get out. But to go back. Because if you don't go, then there is the instant they're going to hunt you down. They're going to make life miserable. They're going to try to kill you. They're going to try to kill your children. Those fears that they have about leaving are there. And so it took me a long time to realize that it really is okay for them to go back. It may actually be the safest thing for them and their children to go back to that environment. Now, what do we need to do? We need to tell them about the resources that they can get so that when they are ready, they can leave. They can move out of that environment. So you really have to check your own beliefs. We have to educate these patients, especially children. Did you know that in 75% of homes where domestic violence is occurring, child abuse also occurs? There is a direct correlation between the two. Oh, both. Absolutely. Women that are being abused will also abuse their children. It is a vicious cycle. And so we see children at school that know no different. My mom used to teach special ed in Houston County School System and had a child that she reported to DHR because he told her that he lived in a dog cage under the porch. Did you know he didn't know anything wrong with that? And absolutely, they had him in a crate underneath the porch. He'd been living there for years. And they were just having a conversation about their bedrooms one day in the classroom. They were all talking about paint because mom was redoing the walls in her special ed classroom. And they were talking about paint colors and what colors their rooms were. And he brought up that he didn't have walls. She said, well, what does your room look like if you don't have walls? And he told her that he lived in a, in a cage under the, under the porch. He did. So these kids, they don't know any different. If that's the way they're being raised, they don't know that, there is a, that, that, that there's a societal normal that's different than what they have. The same thing with abuse. If they are, grow up seeing domestic violence and they grow up as the victim of child abuse, do they know that everybody's not being abused? They have no clue because they're isolated. They don't ever get to go to a friend's house and spend the night and see what somebody else's house looks like. That's the only environment that they know. Um, I'll give you a funny example of that. That's why we spend so much time as school nurses talking to these kids. Because they'll tell you. They want to fit in. I'll give you a great example. We sent both of our children to a Christian daycare here in town. At one point, I was paying more for childcare for two kids in childcare than I was paying for my mortgage on my house. That is the childcare that we, preschool that they were at. So my 10-year-old my now, he was about two, and he was sitting around a table, and they were talking about drinks, what they liked to drink. There's five or six of them. And so how many drink options does a two-year-old typically get? Water, juice, milk, that's about it, right? And so those options had been thrown out, and so Carter wanted to be different than everybody else, but he still wanted to fit into the conversation. So he came up with something that he wanted to tell them about drinks. Well, he couldn't come up with anything other than water, juice, and milk that he got. So you know what he says? He says, my mama's favorite drink is Samuel Adams. <laughs> well, did he lie? No, he did not. However, did he want to just fit in? Now, that was pretty innocent. My, the, I happened to be friends with his preschool teacher. She sent me a text and said, you'll never believe what came out of his mouth. I said, oh, yes, I will. 
However, he just wanted to fit in. They will do the same thing in school. You'll have conversations, and they just want to tell you about what they're doing as well. And so we get a lot of that domestic violence information, a lot of that um, child abuse information just from them surely talking at school. We do have lots of resources. Um, when I was in nursing school at Auburn, my last semester I had a community health class. And part of that class is we had to take Montgomery County and do a survey and identify resources in that type, or no, the area we were going back to. I did this area. Um, the area we were going back to work and identify 20 free resources for patients. And when I got done, I had about 50, and I had no idea the amount of resources that were in the area. At that time, we didn't have, what is it, 211 for resource information. Um, and I had a notebook that I kept with in my locker for years of resources that I'd give numbers out to these um, different patients. Because we do have the resources, it's just being aware of what they are. Um, disasters. We see disasters. We take care of victims of disasters in the ER as well. So when we talk about a disaster, we're talking about anything that exceeds our resources. It doesn't matter what it is. We have just hit, had a disaster. What was it? COVID. It was a pandemic that exceeded our worldly resources. Um, but on a much smaller scale, when you talk hospital area, it's any event that exceeds your resources. It can be foodborne, it can be um, weather, it can be buildings collapsing, it can be car crashes, it can be buses that turn over. It doesn't matter what the cause is other than it exceeds your resources. So there's lots of examples there. We have, when the, we have those, we have mass casualty events. And when we have those mass casualty events, we implement our emergency preparedness plan. Any facility that is accredited by a, a um, governing body like JCO or Joint Commission um, has to have an emergency preparedness plan. They also have to be practiced. Um, and so, um, you, you have different types of emergency preparedness plans. Um, we have plans with HAZMAT because we have a nuclear plant uh, within, what is it, 100 miles? If you have a nuclear plant within 100 miles, you have to have a nuclear um, emergency preparedness plan. And so we have all of these. And so they do have to be practiced. And when we have these disasters, like I said, we move into a triage system that is a mass casualty triage. So when we started Module E, I talked about what we call civilian triage. It's one patient at a time. It's um, not, not overwhelming the system. This is when we have a large number of patients. This is more of a um, military type triage system, but it's mass casualty is what it is. And the focus of mass casualty is the greatest good for the greatest number. Because we have a finite number of resources, we have to do the greatest good for the greatest number. That means that we have patients that we won't treat. Patients that have black tags that are dead or expected to die, we will leave and not treat. For example, Remember me telling you about my 14-year-old dirt bike that had the leg and was bleeding out and hemorrhaging? That patient, had it been a mass casualty event, we would have never treated. Why? Because we dump so many resources into one patient, and we can when it's an isolated event, but if we had 30 of those patients, could we dump the same number of resources into 30 patients? We can't. Um, and so those patients we would be one of those that we would anticipate or expected to die because they're a hypovolemic situation. And so we would not treat them. Why? Because we would turn around and we'd take those resources that we would give to that one patient and now we'll disperse them over about 50 patients. And so now we're treating 50 versus one. Um, so it's the mass, it's the greatest good for the greatest number. You have different colors of tags. Of course, green are your minors all the way up to your blacks that we are dead or expected to die. Green injuries typically um, 
are treated on scene, so are your yellows many times. They set up treatment booths or treatment tents at the scene. Your reds tend to be the ones that you see in your hospitals, but they don't all come through the ER. So once you activate your disaster plan, your roles change and your hospital setup changes. Right now, on a daily basis, if we have some type of, of single mass casualty or single event, the patient comes through the ER. But if you have 100 victims, you can't send them all through the ER. What changes is your entry points into your facilities. So what you might have been using as outpatient surgery now may be a second ER for you. You may now have patients that are coming in off the ambulance and going straight to the OR or straight to the cath lab. Um, you may now have patients that are coming in that essentially you're using other areas of the hospital for, not just your ER. So your, the roles in the hospital will change along with um, some of the um, authority of the facility. Uh, you, we have a central command system and for us our cement, central command system is the city of Dothan's 911 dispatch center. That is our central command. What that does is when we have these mass casualty events, what that does is it basically opens up one central location for communication. And that is now all of PD, all of your sheriff's departments, all of your ambulance services, all of your ERs, all are on a radio frequency that basically all the communication is going through that one location and then dispersed out. Um, so you have a central um, communication. You have a hospital incidents commander and your hospital incidents commander is typically your CEO or your highest level of administration at the facility. They are the ones that implement your disaster plan. They're the ones that call it and say, okay, we're moving into our disaster plan um, and that re-changes the roles of everybody in the facility. Your medical command physician um, is typically an ER physician and they are responsible for resources. And so they essentially get a list of all of the resources available, how many OR rooms you have, how many general surgeons you have, how many orthopedic surgeons, how many hospital beds, how many ICU beds, how many vents, how many units of blood, they get those resources, and as the ambulance is unloading, they designate out those resources. I have five beds in outpatient surgery. You get one of them. I have um, 30 units of blood. They get two, and that is kind of what they do. They keep up with the resources that your facility has. And then you have your triage officers. Your triage officers can be an RN. Many times you see an RN and an emergency room physician and they go to scene to triage. Um, you'll also see your EMS doing your triage. You'll see in this area we have Fort Rucker, so you have lots of soldiers that will do triage. Um, but your triage officer goes to scene and they're the ones that do that rapid assessment and give, give tags out. They're the ones that color code your patients before they actually come to your facility. After each um, disaster or disaster plan practice, um, you have a debriefing, just like we do with simulation. Why do we debrief in simulation? So you can learn. That is the whole purpose of debriefing is to learn so that when you have this incidence again, you now know what you're going to do the same or what you're going to change. And so that is why we have those debriefing situations is we um, learn from those and we correct, we change. We also have to look at um, the psychological response, the mental health of survivors, of healthcare providers, of your, non, uh, of your EMS, your first responders. My big one that I remember um, is 9-11. After we had um, the World Trade Centers collapse, planes go down, um, Pentagon hit, we had all of these first responders that many of them gave their lives taking care of patients or trying to save patients. But then for years, we had them committing suicide. 
we had them um, dying from the just this traumatic stress of the event itself. So we have to look at the psychological response of those that survive and those that do take care of patients as well. Bioterrorism is a threat. We did not think about bioterrorism until after 9-11. Um, bioterrorism, the big thing I want you to get out of bioterrorism is it's got to be an agent that's going to affect a large number of people. Like, if it is something you have to come in hand contact with it or you have to ingest, you're probably not going to, it's probably not going to be effective as a um, bioterrorism agent. When you think bioterrorism, it is typically airborne. Something that you can that can be can affect a large number of people um, at a at one time. So when you think about plague and botulism and anthrax, um, those are all those airborne spores um, that we can see with with bioterrorism. Smallpox is another one that we have to worry about in this country because we eradicated smallpox. Um, what 30, 40. 40, 50 years ago in this country, and now the majority of our population is not vaccinated against smallpox. So military is still vaccinated. My parents were vaccinated, but I'm 42 and I was not vaccinated against smallpox. So we now have the majority of our population that is not vaccinated against smallpox. It is droplet, and so we now have the concern of smallpox being a bioterrorism agent uh, in this country. So let's talk about informed consent real quick so we can talk about um, emergent consent. So when we talk about informed consent for treatment, we've probably all had a patient sign an informed consent or, or at least discussed one with them. But essentially with informed consent, um, the patient understands their treatment options, they make the choice without coercion, and they are given all of their options what is positive about the treatment and how they would do if the treatment wasn't performed. So they're made, they make an educated decision on their treatment. That's essentially an informed consent. With our emergent consents, we treat patients all the time and never get a piece of paper signed because we are covered under an emergent consent. What that basically means is that um, if the patient is not capable of making an informed decision, Significant harm would be done if that decision is not made. And if the patient were to make the decision, that's likely a decision they would make, then we can treat them. We don't have to have consent. We don't have to call anybody. We don't have to ask the next of kin. We don't have to have two nurses on the phone to have a piece of paper signed. Treatment can occur if we have a patient that cannot make that decision. Significant harm will come if the decision is not made. And if they were able to make the decision, it's likely a decision they would make, then we can treat them. That is everything to even giving blood and us not knowing their religious beliefs. We don't have to under an emergent consent. All right? Now, what is our hospital like? Our hospital likes a piece of paper sign. They like two nurses on the phone talking to the next of kin. They like two physicians to sign the chart and agree that this, it needs to be done. But those don't fall under emergent consents. Those fall under save my butt, not emergent consents. So emergent consents, we treat all the time um, in the ER and never get consents. You would not believe the treatments that we do. And then when I got to the floor and the ICU people were getting consents signed. Like, y'all sign a consent for that? We just do it. Well, because that in the ER, you can. On an, in an ICU, you can't. So um, there is a difference in an informed consent and an emergent consent. Drugs. Well, let's talk about some drugs. Now, I'm not reteaching rhythms because you had the rhythms in 202. I'm pre teaching you treatments for the rhythms that you see on the screen. So, what is this first one? It's on the screen. Can't tell. It's SVT. It's on there. Supraventricular tachycardia is what it is. That's what that rhythm is. Um, now, is it regular? Yes. Is there a P wave? There is, you just can't see it because it's so fast. But we treat it with adenosine. Adenosine is given IV. Um, it can be given in the adult patient and in pediatric patients. We gave it in simulation, right? 
Everybody saw SVT on a monitor, whether you knew it or not. Um, you saw it. And SVT uh, and adenosin for the adult, first dose is 6 milligrams, second dose is 12 milligrams, and if you need a third dose in the adult patient, it's, it's 12 milligrams. Pediatric patients can only receive two doses, and if the patient doesn't convert with those, we then cardiovert the patient. So there are several ways that you can give adenosine, and we're going to talk about some of these real quick because some are more effective than others. So there are many times that you find a patient has a bifurcated port, kind of like this. Um, you put adenosine in one port, you put your syringe in another. It has to be a rapid um, IV push followed by a flush, by the way. And when I say rapid, it is as fast as you can push them you give adenosine. So we draw up our adenosine, we draw up our, our flush, and we put adenosine to one, our flush to the other, and we give our adenosine and our flush, and the patient doesn't convert. Why? Do what now? With this setup, why would the patient not convert? Because it's already time by time it gets Well, we're gonna hope we have enough flush to push it on through the line, because that's just the extension. Because they don't get the full dose, exactly. With bifurcated ports, the patient does not get the full dose. Doesn't matter how long the bifurcated ports are, they're still not getting the full dose of adenosine. It's sitting in one of the sides of the port. So if you're using a bifurcated port, your first dose may not work because you just only gave a partial dose instead of a full dose. And by the way, is that technically a medication error? Yes, it is. All right. So what if we just have a single port and we give our medicine, take it off, put our flush on and push our flush and it doesn't work. Why? It wasn't pushed in fast enough. Remember the half-life of adenosine is about five seconds. So it may have taken longer than five seconds for you to push in your adenosine, unscrew one syringe, put the other syringe on and push in your flush. Wasn't effective. All right? So put fluids on the patient. Now this is Viratrol. This is obviously Ms. Fuller's, but we're going to borrow it. We put the patient on fluids. We're going to clamp our other port, by the way, so we just don't need it. And we have fluids running wide open. And we give, this is our closest port to the patient. And by the way, for adenosine, that is way too far from your patient for your closest port. You need something much closer than that. But you put your adenosine on it, you've got your fluids running, you're squeezing your bag, you push your adenosine, and you've got fluids running wide open. Did they get the entire dose of adenosine? Yeah, they did. Well, you're squeezing your bag. It's running wide open. They did get their full dose of adenosine. Did they get it with a rapid flush behind it? Yes. Is it likely to work? As long as it didn't take it longer than five seconds to get from here to the patient because of the distance. You may also see people use needles in a needleless system. They'll take two blunt tips, poke them in two. They're, and typically what, this one doesn't have an extra cap on it. Typically what you'll do is you'll get an extra port and screw it onto the port you already have. Take two of your blunt tips, poke them into your needleless system, and then you push, they'll both fit, and you push your adenosine and your flush, they both go in, there's a rapid succession, the flush follows, and then you just turn around and take off that extra port and throw it away. And so then you have still gotten both the med and the flush in really quickly and they've received the entire dose and it's at a port much closer to the patient. So there's lots of ways to give adenosine, but when you give it, think about are they getting the entire dose and are they getting it fast enough is what you need to be thinking when you give adenosine. So most of the time what you're going to see is somebody squeezing a bag of fluids and somebody else pushing the adenosine on the, on the tubing. Now, this is another big one that I see. So you've got a nurse squeezing the bag and you've got a nurse standing here pushing the adenosine. They push the adenosine, they let go of the plunger, the nurse is squeezing the bag, what's going to happen to that plunger? It's going to fill up and their adenosine stayed right there. They never got it. So if you're pushing the adenosine, you have to hold the plunger down as you take your syringe off or they're not going to get the medicine that you've just pushed in. 
So that's a big error that I see a lot of times with the denison is the nurse pushes the denison and then forgets about the pressure of fluids being pushed through that IV and their plunger fills back up, their moves back up and their syringe fills back up with the fluid that's in there. So several ways that you can give a denison, but it is a rapid succession IV push. 6, 12, 12, 6, 12, and, 6, 12, and 12 for the adult patient. Three doses. Prior to adenosin, we do want to try something like a Valsalva maneuver, a vag some type of vagal maneuver for the patient. For a systole, it is epi. We give epi also for anaphylaxis and for uh, as a bronchodilator for asthma. You do not need to know the dosage for the three. Just realize you can give it for more than just a systole. Um, but we do give epi for a systole. For symptomatic bradycardia, we give atropine. Remember with symptomatic bradycardia, just because their heart rate's 40 doesn't mean they're symptomatic. They have to be symptomatic bradycardia for atropine. It is given IV. Um, there is a max dose on atropine. We also see it given to reduce um, salivation and dry secretions as well at end of life. You may see them given atropine to dry up secretions uh, in patients. Lidocaine is used as an antidysrhythmic. It is used for ventricular arrhythmias, so VTAC and VFib. It is given IV. It's a um, you can it's a premix. You don't have to measure it out. But for ventricular dysrhythmias, so VTAC, VFib. Amniodarone is also a dis, uh, antidysrhythmic agent. But it can be used for atrial dysrhythmias as well. So VTAC, VFib, AFib, and a flutter, we can use um, a uh, amniodarone. Amniodarone is a little harder to use than lidocaine. So if you have just a true ventricular dysrhythmia, many, pa many physicians will still choose lidocaine over amniodarone only because amniodarone has a loading dose and a maintenance dose. So you have to mix amniodarone and have two doses, whereas lidocaine, you literally have a premix that you spike and you hang, um, or you have a push. But uh, amniodarone works for atrial and ventricular arrhythmias. This is torsades. You may not have had torsades in 202. The underlying is VTAC. However, it has, um, it's called turning on a point or torsades de pone is the name of it. And what you see is a narrowing and a widening of that complex. That is torsades. It is indicative of a magnesium deficiency, or we treat it with magnesium. You can see it with potassium and magnesium deficiencies. Typically in a patient that's had GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or somebody that's an alcoholic and malnourished is typically the patients that you see torsades in. Why do we give magnesium to treat it even if it might be a potassium issue? The underlying is VTAC. We can't push and we can't give potassium fast or we'll kill the patient. We can give magnesium really quickly and we're not going to hurt the patient. So it is used for magnesium low uh, hypo um, kalemia. Um, it is also used for a low magnesium However, we give magnesium to treat it because we can't push potassium. Levofed. I bet every one of you have seen Levofed this semester. Um, there is the whole Levofed, leave them dead, and what they're talking about in about 72 hours, if they're on max doses of Levofed, they are going to have necrosis of the extremities, their fingers and toes. We are seeing lots of patients come back now after surviving COVID, being in units for a while on vasopressors and having amputations of fingers and toes because they were on these max doses um, during the height of COVID when they, um, they were trying to keep them alive with their pressures and now their extremities are necrotic. So um, Levofed is used to increase 
blood pressure of the patient. So for acute hypotension, that's why we use levofed. Levofed does increase heart rate. So you have to be mindful of that when you give it. Not only does it increase um, blood pressure increases heart rate. Hold on, Dr. DeBose was calling me. Um, neosinephrine is another one that we use. It's also used for hy hypotension. It increases blood pressure without increasing heart rate. We talked about Narcan, we use it for narcotic overdoses. Um, Narcan, there is a push, like we're seeing Narcan nasal sprays, there's a push to put Narcan over the counter because of the opioid crisis in this country. Um, it wouldn't be so, I wouldn't be surprised if Narcan became one of those that you could just go buy at any Walgreens or CVS versus having a prescription for. Um, but it does uh, reverse narcotics. We use it for respiratory depression in the patient. Romazicon reverses benzodiazepines. Again, for a patient that is um, having difficulty breathing because of benzodiazepines, we'll give romazicon to. It does have a max dose. Dopamine. Dopamine is another one that we use. It is used for hemodynamic stability. It will improve pressure. It will improve just the hemodynamics of the patient. Um, it will improve renal perfusion and urine output. Um, we see dopamine used on a lot of patients, especially in combination with other um, drugs as well. Nipride is used for hypertensive crises. So a patient that's blood pressure is high, we will use Nipride. Nipride does have to be covered. It is light sensitive. So make sure when you give Nipride that you have it in a covered bag or a, a green, a light bag. A green bag is usually what they have them in, green or black. But um, it is light sensitive. Again, it is IV, but it is for the hypertensive crisis. And then tetanus. Tetanus is our last one. Everybody that comes in the ER gets a tetanus shot. If you don't know the date of your last tetanus shot, guess what? Write, write it down because you're getting one that day. It's part of routine vaccinations, but we also um, need boosters as an adult. All right, that is module E. That was it. I, was, I mean, that got done three minutes ago, right? Four minutes ago. They're waiting on me to shut up. Okay. So, do it now. Will there, be on the test? there will be treatment modalities for rhythms on the test because that is covered here. Yes. So, two things. I need my first clinical group to stick around for just a minute after class so we can make sure all the eval tools signed off. My second clinical group we've got right now, I've got your paperwork, I'll give it back in a minute. But before we get started, I have a, an announcement. I didn't want you to hear it through the grapevine. Um, this was bar none, the most. Difficult decision I've ever made. Part of it because of her. <laughs> Blame her. Um, I am leaving Wallace. I am taking a full time position at AUM. This has been in the works for quite some time. Um, and I made my final decision Saturday, and as of Monday, submitted my four week um, notif notif notification here. I've been here since 2009. And um, the school is very important to me. And again, it's this relationship and the school. And I love my students. I love teaching. So when I tell you I had a little mini panic attack Sunday, I did. I was composing my letter of resignation. And I told my husband, I my oh, God, what am I doing? And he's like, is this everything you've dreamt of? Is this everything you've ever wanted? And so it was definitely not a decision I made lightly. Um, it took a lot of... Um, a lot of praying. Trust me when I say praying. And a lot of trying to decide what's the right decision, what's the right direction do I need to go at this point in my career. So um, I will be teaching in the graduate program as I do currently. I will be there 
mobility coordinator, so trust me, you're going to heal from me. <laughs> and I am also going to be their remediation retention specialist, working for with students who are at risk. So I'm super excited about it. Um, it is a, it's, an, it's a great opportunity. And it's a school where I earned my bachelor's degree and through a joint program my master's. And so, I, you know, I've got some, it feels like home too. But I want to tell you guys this. Um, you're making us cry. I've cried enough for all of us, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> You're part of the reason this was so hard, okay? Because I love my students. I know. Listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna demand excellence, and I will make no compromises for that, or no apologies for that, because I don't want you to be a good nurse. I want you to be an excellent nurse. I want you to be the nurse that everybody wants to work with. I want you to be the nurse that when that family walks away, they feel cared for. That somebody really. They weren't just doing a job. There's a big difference, a huge difference between a nurse that's just here because it's good money, lateral movement, but a nurse that demonstrates that they truly, this individual person is important to me and I want the very best that the possible care I can deliver regardless of their background, their lifestyle, their belief system, whatever it may be, I'm going to be that nurse that this person needs me to be. And I want you to be that person. And that's why I'm, I will not compromise for anything less than excellence. And I'll demand that out of you. And I'll continue to hope that you will want that out of yourself, okay? So obviously, obviously I'll finish out this term because in a professional setting, you have to give a full week notice. And when you're in an education setting, you have to complete a term before you go anywhere else. So um, they will want me to start their term at AUM. I told them under no circumstances am I gonna do that because I will always fulfill my obligations elsewhere. They're like, okay. So I will be starting there when this term is over. But anyway, you guys are part of the reason it was so hard. I'm telling you, it really was. Ask my husband. Normally when we're situated in the evenings and we got everything good and we're in our comfy clothes, and if I like, oh, let's go for a ride and get a cup of coffee or something, he's like, oh, what? I looked at him and I said, let's go get a blizzard. He's like, okay. <laughs> Okay, honey. Now mind you, he's got his boxers on. Okay. We didn't. I ended up thinking, well, that's eight points for half a blizzard. I don't want to do that. <laughs> but, but I was really close. <laughs> really, really close. But anyway, I, I do wish you guys the best, okay? I'll be with here with you for the end of the term, obviously. Um, but I want you guys to know what an awesome way for me to be able to leave my career here with such an awesome group of students, okay? You guys came forward with a really good um, cohort personality. Each cohort has a personality and your cohort personality was a real positive one as you went through. And so your faculty before you said, oh, you're going to enjoy this group. They're a lot of fun. They want to learn. They want to do well. And I, we, we have seen that. We don't be, hear that about every group. No, trust me. <laughs> we don't. No, no, no. Trust me. That's not the way it is. But at least you guys were a great cohort to, to end my career here with. Okay. So I'm mean, always going to be here for you. And again, you will hear from me. She'll you call me every guys. semester and go, okay, oh, who's yeah. graduating? You're right. And, and again, Dr. Neal was a really big part of why I struggled with this decision so much. You don't find these kinds of relationships everywhere you go in life that are successful and we get it. We get each other. She can order for me at a restaurant, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> it's, that's how well we worked together and how well we knew each other and, and we have the same you know, requirements and demands out of students, so we made a very, very solid team. But um, anyway, so I just wanted y'all to hear before you hear it through the grapevine, okay? Because it's word starting to get out there now. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I want y'all to be blindsided, okay? But I will be with you till your graduation. Okay. okay. All right, guys. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm excited and scared. I'm like, oh, what about done? Oh. Then it'll be all right. <laughs> it shall be okay. So, Thank you. I will miss you guys. I really do. But again, I expect to see you, Colin. I know you said you just want to finish your associate's degree. Do you worry about that bachelor's degree later? <laughs> Get them. Get them. <laughs> Jay, you right there on our list. Don't make uh, don't make sure you call Colin I I hope you do. Okay, I really do. I really do. But it's it's been you guys have been fun. It's been a good semester.
We have now, enjoyed y'all. Dr. Neal, doesn't it look like we have a smaller group in this classroom than the other classroom? Tell Is you, it not weird? Yeah, Tuesday, when y'all were in the other classroom with those individual chairs, it looked like, like there were way too many of y'all. I, I was like, <laughs> it's like, I got the roll, and they all signed, and there's no <laughs> extra names, but. And when I walked in, I thought, there's more people in here than we usually have. Anyway. Oh, we never made it to y'all? Aquan just stopped. <laughs>